Hey homebrewers and welcome to episode 2 in our odyssey into homebrewed New England IPA. Now last week we were given a really exciting opportunity which was to try a new yeast from Lalamund Brewing which just happens to be a dried version of Verdant Brewing Co's own house strain. Now we decided, obviously, to brew a classic New England IPA with it and along the way try some techniques to get minimum oxidization, maximum hop utilization, loads of hop flavor and of course lots of character from that exciting, kind of unique New England style yeast. Now if you missed part one you can watch that by clicking up here, but if you have seen it it's time for part two, the cellaring. So let's do a lightning quick update. We are aiming for a 6%-ish hazy juicy beer that has lots of citrus character to cut through the lovely sweet apricot and vanilla notes from the yeast. To do that we built a thick base loaded with pale malt, wheat and oats and a touch of carapil. We got to 1.060 original gravity and then hopped it with a pathetic amount of magnum but a huge dose of more exciting aromatic hops after flame out. So we'd selected our hops, a bit of pithy citra, lots of sweaty mango-y mosaic and some pineapple, some brew one. And we'd added those during the whirlpool stage and that was gonna get as maximum flavor and aroma with as little bitterness as possible. But the most important hop additions in this style are yet to come. That's the dry hops and that's where it all gets a little bit nerdy. Now when I was chatting to James, head brewer at Verdant, he absolutely blew my mind by saying that he doesn't actually double dry hop his beers, which means he doesn't add any hops during active fermentation. We'll do some hopping at the start of fermentation. Oh, are you? Would you do you not do that at Verdant? Nah. Right, so you're not, you're not actually hopping during active fermentation? Nah, sorry. I should have maybe clarified that. Yeah, we don't bother with any biotransformation stuff. Now this early dry hopping addition, which is done when the yeast is at its absolute peak of activity, and there is a real peak of activity with this new Lalaman yeast, like the Krausen is so high, you can almost hear it bubbling away as it works. And if you add hops at this stage, at this peak, you can get a process called biotransformation, which is as all of the yeast is chomping away at the sugars that have come from the malt, it also chomps away lots of other chemical compounds in that liquid, including hop oils, hop flavor compounds. And what you'll get is in the shortening of those, you'll get the creation of new chemicals, which might taste of other stone fruits, of other citric fruits and the idea is you get new and more complex flavors. Now to my mind that's one of the key tenets of New England IPA brewing, that DDH double dry hop kind of approach, but James argues that there's so much hop in suspension already just from the whirlpooling stage, you don't actually need to add any more to potentially get that process and to some extent adding more hops at this point that's going to sit in that liquid for a long time you do increase the chance of getting some astringency so they just completely skip that process but for a homebrew setup i actually think that we're not going to get as much hop utilization as james does with all his know-how all his really great hops all his great equipment and i'm going to use every opportunity i have to get as much hop flavor in there so i'm just adding 50 grams in deference to james i don't want that astringency and also because it's at the peak of fermentation there's a huge blanket of co2 so i'm fairly confident I can unscrew the lid, dump those hops in quickly and screw it, just like he said. With that done and the speed at which this yeast is fermenting, which is incredibly fast, all I've got to do is wait a couple of days and then raise the temperature of that fermentation for a couple of days to 22 and that gives the yeast the chance to chomp through all the diacetyl, which is that buttery flavour we really, really don't want in a New England IPA. Once all of that's gone, I can cold crash it down to about 15 degrees, which is, as James suggests, the best time to add that final huge charge of hops. From there, I'm going to crash it to 2 degrees, or if you've got a better fridge than me, even colder. Um, and give those hops about two days to really inject all that flavor and aroma. Now it's the adding of those final dry hops, massive amounts of dry hops, where things get really interesting. So James and I had a chat about how we can make sure that our beer is safe from oxidation. And what we came up with is we need to bubble CO2 up through the beer to make sure there's a blanket layer of that CO2 sat there protecting the beer. So the way we're gonna do that, we think, is using my CO2 regulator like, like, you know, just a classic CO2 regulator with my soda stream attached, which is what I'll be using uh, to push the beer around, to carbonate it, and to finally pour the beer. Now, what I've done is I've taken the normal tubing, 
And in lieu of proper attachments, I've attached a bit of grandfather piping to it, which is exactly the right diameter to connect to the faucet at the bottom of my fermenter. And then what I've got to do is I've got to turn on the gas at the same time as opening that tap, which would usually spray beer everywhere and hope that the CO2 will keep the beer in place. And indeed, as I turn the gas up, force CO2 up through the beer. So I'm going to give that a go now, and if it goes wrong, it's James's fault. Yeah, I hope you know what you're doing, James slash Johnny. So that went better than I could have ever hoped. That was all good. I've now got my hops in safely. I've roused the hops safely. And now I've set that to crashes down to three degrees, which is when everything will fall back out of suspension. And hopefully I'll have a hazy, but not full of hop compound beer to add into my keg. Of course, nature had other ideas. The UK was hit with an absurd heat wave that meant it took a full two days just to get down to two degrees, forcing me to wait four days before kegging. Luckily I had a lot of beer and a giant fan to sit in front of while I waited, but I still think I started to have Obi-Wan Kenobi style hallucinations of James. So hot. What? What if my beer's ruined? But that's exactly what brewing's all about, right? You kind of you have this idea of what you want it to be and then you you implement all the recipe and the process points and then life, the world, nature throws some other things into the pan and you end up with something a bit different. Shut up, James. Four days later though, it was time for the final step, the kegging and the carving. So it's been kegging day, the kitchen looks like a bomb's hit it, and it kind of did. I had quite a lot of fun with one of my COT bottles, but that got resolved before anyone died. Um, and we are now transferred fully into keg, that went very smoothly. I purged and I purged and I purged and I purged to make sure that there was no CO2 in there. So what I'm left with is a couple of hundred grams of now very saturated in beer hops to get rid of, and my gravity meter right here. So. Uh, this got to 0 0.13, so that's about where we expected it to go. And given my uh, starter gravity of 0 0.60, we have got to 6.2% ABV. So really happy with that colour and the haze um, and the look of the body as it rolls around the glass. This isn't quite pouring a cask in your house moment, but this is pretty nerve-wracking because I've never really nailed a New England IPA at home. Until now. Dead excited about how that's going to turn out, so long as I didn't oxidise it during the process. Oh, I'm so happy. Uh, I'm going to carbonate for a couple of days and then Brad's going to come over and we'll give it a try. I'm also going to purge some bottles and fill them and send them down to Verdant because really they're the guys that will tell me how close I've got uh, to something of their standard with their yeast. Mate. It's great to be back. Isn't it? I feel like I'm sitting on the wrong side from usual. I feel like I always sit on that side. But how was the cellaring process, more importantly, Johnny? Oh, it was a breeze. <laughs> it's an absolute breeze. Um, I can see how the home brews that I'd done before of New England IPA never worked. Like, this was much more involved, much more considered. Um, and actually, I used a slightly lower hopping rate. Um, that we did with the with the first batches, like with Drifter, right? Um, and hopefully, I'm expecting to get a lot more because we did some stuff to get better extraction and much lower oxidation character. Because mm -hmm. though we didn't really oxidize the Drifter home brews, it was definitely muted. Mm. Whereas I've poured this, I haven't tasted it yet. I'm waiting for you, but I've poured this and it looks beautiful. Ha! Should we do? Can't it? Wait, let's do Are it. You ready? Go on, look at that. Tell them about it. Tell them how beautifully golden it is. This is golden. Uh, the, the aroma coming off of this is, is unreal. Are you getting the aroma already? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, this is haze for days, bro. Yeah, it's properly hazy, but not 
an unattractive Merc. No. Um, which quite a lot of my, my it's, homebrews it's have. It's not before. green, it is golden. Absolutely. And then if you give it a swirl, you will find lots of beautiful tight white head, which is endlessly pleasing oh. to me because that's another thing that's easy to destroy with homebrew methods. And it sticks around pretty well as well. Should we get the aroma? Mate, let's get the aroma. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of apricot. That yeast character is massive, isn't it? Yeah. The the apricot was the first thing I smelled when I put it up to my face was was apricot. That sweet apricot milk bottle thing that we picked mm. up um, in Verdant Spear is a hundred percent here, right? Oh hell yeah! It feels and tastes and smells like a Verdant beer. And then that tropical kind of pineapple thing. Yeah. Which is, I just love that flavour. Yeah, I'm awesome. so glad we put it in just to cut yeah. through. Yeah, um, it's really done its job, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. It sliced through that, you know, really sweet, rounded yeastiness. <laughs> this, are you sure this is a homebrew? I am not, I am not trolling you by like <laughs> pouring verdant beer into what here. The fuck? That is genuinely what we made. Wow. Uh, genuinely what we hopped. And if you served me that at a festival, I'd be like, sweet, where did you get that from? Let's get some more. I'd, I'd just, yeah, exactly. I'd be like, that's still the whole festival. Yeah. Really, it's really creamy. Loads of head, loads of apricot aroma, mm. soft peachiness. There is a, a tiny hint of astringency on the finish, which is, I think, because I just left it on the hops for a little bit too long. Otherwise... I'd maybe up the, the genuine bitterness a little bit. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's it. I, 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 I'm Just slightly up that, that pathetic ad addition of three grams of mag. Pathetic. Now, we can't drink it all because we've got to send some of this down to Verdant. So that's going to be the ultimate test. What do Verdant think of this? Yes. Do they recognise it as a Verdant beer like we do or a Verdant yeast? Um, and J James is critical. He will let us know if this hasn't come up to the standards he'd expect from his own yeast. Mm. So we'll, we'll, we'll fill up some bottles and we'll cut to the beautiful town of Falmouth oh. and see what Verdon think. Hello. Hey, Johnny. I've got your beer, a fresh glass. Thanks for sending this down. Let's crack it open and see what we've got. There she is. Two fingers, white foam. No, I'm only joking. Um, yeah, looks murky. Excuse the um, black eye, by the way. Had a fight with some Ikea furniture. Smells fruity. Yeah, that smells good, Johnny. I'm impressed. Nice and sweaty. I'd say a tiny hint of oxidation, but nothing crazy. Just a, like maybe 10%. Nice and smooth. It's like, Really posh um, orange juice <laughs> with a very subtle bite. So it's quite dry on the palate, quite a dry feeling that's drying as you go through the drinking experience. Um, me personally, I would prefer a slightly bigger body to it, and a little bit softer and a longer finish. And the hot impact is punching through. That's very pleasant. I would happily, and I probably will, just chug through that. Definite room for improvement, but uh, a good start for sure. I'm, I am noticing the verdant yeast, apricot vibes coming through. Um, yeah, I'd be really pleased with that, Johnny. Well done. So there we have it, the verdict on our New England IPA by one of the world's best brewers. Um, 
I can't believe the feedback. I'm not sure James could either, really. Um, there were definitely some flaws there. Like there is some, a little bit of heat, a little bit of astringency there, and we could have got some more hot flavor out of it. But the fact that we could produce something that somebody like James wouldn't immediately spit out and dismiss with just, uh, just a plastic bucket and our 80 quid corny keg is absolutely incredible. And I think it's a testament to the processes that came, we came up with, our hop choices, which were very, very considered, and uh, the malt beer, which basically came straight out of Verdant's playbook anyway. But I think the real hero here, other than my have-a-go hero uh, hacked homebrew fridge in these temperatures, is definitely the yeast. Um, it dealt with some really tough temperatures throughout all of that. It absolutely raced through fermentation, which is really important and really good for homebrewing because it means that you're going to spend less time with those hops, that green matter, in the fermenter with your beer. Um, and it also pumped out lots and lots of tasty apricot, stone fruit, vanilla kind of flavours that mean that we don't have to get quite so much hop utilisation, hop flavour out of it as homebrewers, which is really tricky to do on a small scale with the equipment that we'll be using. And so much of that amazing yeast capability is down to the technical expertise and the incredible technology and investment that Lalamund have put behind these yeasts that they're producing now. And we saw that firsthand when we went to Vienna. And I heartily recommend you guys looking at that video and also giving uh, these beautiful Lalamund yeasts a go. You know, what's really great about this yeast is A, we're gonna see lots of other amazing breweries now using it, and that's dead exciting. I've already had like a great porter um, from Unity down in Southampton made with that yeast. That's how flexible it is. And also some great New England IPAs and stuff like that. I'll be playing around with it. It seems like it'll be great for lower ABV beers as well, because it'll add body, it'll add flavor without having to over hop, which can throw these lighter beers out of balance. So there's lots that we can do with it. So whether you're just starting out in New England IPA and you want kind of a fail safe yeast that's gonna guarantee some flavor, or if you're a very experienced home brewer and you're looking to take that next step up, use those techniques that we've used here, use that yeast for sure for the amount of flavor that you're gonna get out of it. So huge thanks to Lallemann for supporting us, huge thanks to Verdant and James for all of the advice that they gave us. And please, please, please guys at home, if you brew it, let us know your recipe, let us know how it goes. And if you need some tips and some inspiration or just want to brew exactly as we did, the recipe is down below in the descriptions. Enjoy.